Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started um, with today's Grand Rounds. So I would like to introduce um, Emily Wong and Carrie Gross, who will be our speakers today. Emily Wong is a professor of uh, Yale School of Medicine and directs the SAGE Center for Health and Justice. She leads the center's research program, the Health Justice Lab, which receives NIH funding to investigate how incarceration influences chronic health conditions, including cardiovascular disease, cancer, and opioid use disorder, and uses a participatory approach to study interventions which mitigate the impacts of incarceration. She received her medical degree from Duke University Medical Center and her MAS from the University of California, San Francisco. As an internist, she has cared for thousands of individuals with a history of incarceration and is co-founder of the Transitions Clinic Network, a consortium of 40 community health centers nationwide dedicated to caring for individuals recently released for correct from correctional facilities by employing community health workers with histories of incarceration. Dr. Carrie Gross is a professor of medicine and public health and founding director of the Cancer Outcomes Public Policy and Effectiveness Research Center. His research ad addresses comparative effectiveness, quality, and health equity with a focus on cancer prevention and treatment. He received his medical degree from New York University School of Medicine and completed his residency in internal medicine at New York Hospital Cornell Medical Center. His research has been supported by the National Cancer Institute and the American Cancer Society, among others. As a former Robert Wood Johnson Foundation clinical scholar, Dr. Gross has advanced training in biostatistics, epidemiology, research ethics, and outcomes research. Please join me in welcoming them um, for their talk about incarceration and cancer care, a key focus for health justice efforts. Thank you. It's a real, real pleasure to be here, to be speaking with my friend and colleague, Carrie Gross, on a topic probably that hasn't been covered at the Cancer Center before. And so we just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, this year marks the 50th anniversary of mass incarceration, a term that's used to describe legal and policy decisions that have led to a massive explosion and expansion of incarceration as punishment and restrictions on public social services like food, housing, and employment and civic life, including voting, following incarceration. By almost all accounts, and also among bipartisan leadership, it's been seen as largely ineffective in reducing crime, keeping our communities safe, and much too costly. And its effects have been largest among Black people, poor people, and has left in its wake poor health for individuals who've been incarcerated, but also their families and our communities. While there are lots of questions about how to undo this harm, I'm certain of two things. As physicians, as researchers, as health system leaders, we've been complicit in creating the circumstances by which mass incarceration and the healthcare system behind bars is virtually invisible to us. I'm also confident that we're responsible for finding these solutions. And so for the next 45 minutes or so, uh, we'd like for you to entertain how extraordinarily wide the reach is of uh, the criminal justice system, how it impacts our work to create healthier communities and hope that at the end, you'll start considering how cancer equity must necessarily attend to the injustices in uh, the criminal legal system uh, in the ways that we all might individually proceed. We have no disclosures. And so I wanted to start in a grand rounds fashion with a patient to ground our conversation for today. Uh, one of the first patients that I saw when I began my career was a 40 year old man who was incarcerated just for a few years who during his incarceration was diagnosed with leukemia. He was scared out of his mind. It was the first time that he had any sort of health condition. Uh, and of course, he was behind bars, away from his family, away from his social support. And when he was introduced to the care team, prepared for his first chemotherapy, he was shackled in the hospital while receiving intrathecal chemotherapy. And this was chilling to him. He of course refused to continue treatment and ended up dying from his cancer. And I want to begin our conversation uh, this morning about thinking about what our role is as providers to advocate for patients like him and others so that the patient treatment experience is different and humane, honoring him as a person first. From an outside perspective, if you didn't know the story and maybe you're just looking at the charts, you might think that the patient's not compliant. Uh, you might think that they're refusing treatment. But framed a different way, how might the health system do differently by those who are most vulnerable? And today, today, we're gonna to start by defining mass incarceration. So to give kind of real terms and concrete descriptions about what this is, 
Uh, then we'll discuss the healthcare system behind bars uh, in uh, carceral systems and the experience post-release. Uh, we'll then shift to presenting some of our own research on mass incarceration and its impacts on health outcomes using data uh, from across the Yale Cancer Center catchment area. And lastly, end with some concluding thoughts. And so just to start, and maybe this isn't news to all, but I think it's important for us just to land here that the U.S. incarcerates more people than any country in the world. And there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, but one is just that we've criminalized substance use, mental health conditions, and poverty. And so much of what we do is take care of health system issues within the criminal legal system. There are 7 million individuals that are currently under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system um, on any given day. And this breaks down, and this is a slightly an old slide, so post-COVID, this means that about 1.9 million individuals are behind bars and closer to 5 million are being supervised in the community. And just to break it down, so jails um, are uh, facilities that house those that are awaiting adjudication of crime or serving sentences of less than a year. Prisons are those facilities that house those that have been sentenced, serving sentences of more than a year. And so while the population behind jails in any given day is smaller, there's a huge throughput. So we actually don't know how many it is, but it's over seven to 10 million move in and out of these jail facilities. And then the larger proportion, again, that's living in the community with us is on a community system of supervision. And this is broken down into parole and probation. So parole, you've been sentenced to the crime, released from prison, and you're released into the community. And probation are those that are sentenced of a crime and now serving their whole sentence in the community. And so all told, and again, the estimates aren't perfect, but about 7 million adults have a criminal record in this country. And each of these individuals confront a myriad of collateral consequences. They've served their time and still, because of their criminal record, face barriers to getting food, housing, employment, even voting in this country, which all told constitutes the large toll and tail of mass incarceration. Those who are incarcerated are disproportionately poor men of color. Um, using life table measurements in 2021, uh, when you look at the uh, lifetime likelihood of imprisonment uh, for all men, it's one out of 10 men in this country will spend some time in prison. When you break it down by racial categories, again, uh, white men, it's one out of 20. Black men, it's one in five. And when I started residency, that number was one in three. And so now we're narrowing the disparity, but it's still extraordinarily large. And for Latino men, it's one in eight. Similarly, incarceration is far less likely for women, but black women are far more likely to be incarcerated in their lifetime compared to white uh, female counterparts. And so what um, the question I guess that we're presenting today is as follows, that by doctors, I often get asked, you know, what's different among those with a history of incarceration? Aren't they just like any patients who are poor that have many social needs that we're not attending to, or those that are homeless, or those that have substance use disorder? What is it that uniquely defines them um, as being at poor risk? And by researchers, we get asked the questions of causality. Again, is this really, truly an independent risk factor? And, you know, I'm not sure we're ever going to know there isn't a, you know, an ethical basis by which you randomize individuals to incarceration. But in the next few slides, what I wanted to do was give you an inside look into pictures. How many of y'all have stepped foot into a prison or jail before? Okay, so some, but not all. And how many have provided health care behind bars? Great. Um, again, a few, fewer, uh, but not everyone. And so what I wanted to do was give you an inside look on what healthcare looks like um, behind bars and just to try to convince you on face validity alone that exposure to incarceration is a unique experience that definitely impacts health. And so to start, and I think what drew me to this uh, field and kind of area uh, is the following fact that healthcare is constitutionally guaranteed in prison. It's one of the only places in the United States where we have a constitutional guarantee in care. And so just give a pause to that. Um, and what this means is that there's a large group of young black men 
poor folks that first access healthcare as adults behind bars. In fact, our data and others show that about 40% of individuals are newly diagnosed with a chronic health condition while they're behind bars. And to me as a primary care physician, this blew my mind, but this also was something that really drew me into this work. After 50 years of this policy, what we've been seeing is the aging of whole generations behind bars. The media, if you'll watch you know, Netflix, or, um, it gives us the impression that uh, folks that are in prison are actually this young, healthy lot. And the reality of it is, is like this gentleman who has COPD, uh, um, they, many individuals are aging behind bars. 85% of those that are incarcerated have a chronic medical condition that warrants longitudinal primary care. This includes physical health conditions like diabetes, hypertension, asthma, infectious diseases like hepatitis C, HIV, of course, substance use disorder, mental health disorders. And then of course, because of the aging behind bars have higher rates of cancer. Um, and you know, just to take a look at each of these pictures, I want you to ground this photo. Again, this was taken in San Quentin. Um, uh, and of course I have per, uh, permission from uh, the prison and these patients to be sharing these photos but they're just waiting to see a doctor. And so I just want you to orient your attention to like, again, the correctional officers overseeing this delivery of care. And there's a patient that's waiting there to see a doctor who's held in a cage. And so this is how healthcare is delivered behind bars. Of course, there's a constitutional guarantee to care, but access is limited by institutional policies. And this picture, I want you to look at that pink slip. So that pink slip is a kite. And it's a form that at the time, it, this doesn't happen in California anymore because it's under federal receivership, but it happens still across the US. Uh, individuals uh, who need to see a doctor have to fill out that pink form. They fill out the pink form, the kite, and then first person that evaluates it is a correctional officer. If there's a medical need deemed by a correctional officer, and think about the power kind of hierarchies that exist within carceral systems, then it goes to a nurse. And after it goes to a nurse, then it goes to a physician for review, and then the person can see a physician. And so, you know, it's not like in the, in the community. You need to see a doctor. There's a long wait. You can always roll up to an emergency department, and you'll be seen. It might be hours, you know, but you'll be seen, and you'll be seen by a physician. It isn't the case behind bars. And then of course the self-management of chronic conditions is difficult and it's just wholly different than how we, uh, our expectations are within the community health system. And so this is a picture of a patient um, again, who uh, was first diagnosed with hypertension behind bars, um, had hypertensive emergency, sent to the outside hospital with this diagnosis, coming back. And we're doing rounds on those that have come back, you know, in kind of a discharge planning rounds. And I just want to orient you to the picture again, there's no privacy. He's in a typical cell block. And you can see that we've thrown the blood pressure cuff through the hole. The gentleman is strapping it up around his arm. He's not seated. This is not probably a very accurate blood pressure medication, right? Uh, blood pressure measurement. Each morning, this person is called by a correctional officer to go get his meds. And so his amlodipine, his lisinopril is doled out. The nurse gives him a cup. The, he takes the cup. He takes the medications she checks to see if he's cheeked it. I mean, these are blood pressure medications. And then he rolls back to his cell. And so adherence is almost perfect, um, but it's incredibly passive. And again, it's at the behest of a correctional officer. Cancer care is similar, that they rely on correctional officers and workers to get people to go to their mammograms, get people to go to pap smears. And so you can see that there's a whole different layer by which chronic conditions are managed that's different than in the community. Similarly, this patient uh, rarely, if ever, in most correctional facilities keeps that medication on his person. So it doesn't have to be like, oh, Today, I got to eat this after my meal. It's always in the morning. He's always called up at the same darn time, right? Um, never draws up his insulin uh, for chemo, uh, for uh, if he's newly diabetic, never draws up his own insulin, never uses a glucometer. And so kind of what we ask of our patients in the community is horribly different than, again, what the carceral system asks of patients behind bars. Um, lastly, if this patient needed to see a physician, um, often he has to put a, down a, a three buck copayment to see the physician. Oh, there's a little swelling in his legs. Um, having started on Norvask, wants to see the doctor. And you're asking, well, three bucks. What's three bucks? 
Well, three bucks is essentially equivalent to four, do- uh, four days of salary. So if you're lucky enough to have a job, it's 75 cents uh, is your daily salary. And so again, to be able to see a physician is a real challenge and especially in navigating these chronic health conditions. And lastly, I share this, that the conditions of confinement impact uh, disease management. This is a patient with COPD who's oxygen dependent, but you could think about him as also a patient with lung cancer who's oxygen dependent, who's being held in solitary confinement. Uh, Solitary confinement is is, uh, a place where you stay in kind of an eight by six foot cell, 23 hours a day. And often um, when, uh, and you'll notice of course that the tank is held outside the cell. And as providers walking by this person's cell, you would hear him intermittently bam on the door. Um, And this was his kind of way of letting us know that the tubing was kinked and he could no longer breathe. Um, The rationale being that the tank, it's too dangerous to have inside, right? That health is secondary to punishment, to control, to safety. And what I want you to think about is putting yourself in the place of the patient. He's seeing physicians, healthcare providers walk on by him, um, complicit in these health harming behaviors. And the question is, how could you actually treat a system that, uh, trust a system that treats you in this way? And so, you know, I get asked the question often, like, well, this is, you know, horrifying, worrisome, but what does this have to do with me? Um, it, you know, I practice in the community. Almost everyone comes home, is released from these carceral systems. 95% of individuals that are incarcerated end up back into the community. And then over three years time, and then again, five year times, almost two thirds go back into the carceral system and over five years time, 75%. And so what we have is a large population here in the United States, but in New Haven even, that cycle in and out of these two health systems, ours in the community and the carceral system. What happens when he walks out the door? So y'all know that if you have a patient that's being discharged from Smilo, even if they're here for an ob stay, you've at least arranged the medications, a a primary care follow-up, a cancer center follow-up. You've faxed the medications over. You've arranged for an appropriate discharge. Uh, Many individuals that are released from carceral systems um, have hardly any discharge planning set up. Um, And what this means is that they're given a short supply of medications here in Connecticut, it's about 28 days, but in lots of carceral systems around the country, it's no medications. Um, They have to find their own primary care appointment, mental health, substance use treatment. I've had patients released without chemotherapy arranged in the community. And so they're coming back into a community health system, which we already know, it's fragmented. It's hard to coordinate all these health care appointments you know, as a person in the community right now for me, much less you've been incarcerated for two, five, 20 years. When people come home, they also often have significant barriers to meeting their basic needs. Our patients often are coming home without a dime to them. They do not have a place to find, they do not have housing. There's no food, there's no employment. And primary among their minds is trying to reunify with their families. And so not surprisingly, there's a worsening of health outcomes, uh, risk of hospitalizations, and of course, a high risk of death. And so during uh, residency, almost 20 years ago, I became uh, obsessed with what I thought was going to be a real easy question. It's like we do transitions of care all the time. We're going to transition folks from, uh, and again, I did residency in San Francisco, from uh, the California Department of Corrections back into San Francisco. And um, because in San Francisco, there's a large, robust civil rights community of formerly incarcerated individuals leaned on them to, to convene them to say, what are the components of healthcare that you want to see in a transitions care program? And they wanted early access. They wanted physicians, healthcare providers that knew about the risks of incarceration could even say, welcome home. We know what it was like inside. We're going to help you come home. But most importantly, they wanted a community health worker, a person with a history of incarceration to be centered in primary care. That person would help them navigate the healthcare system, which is hard to navigate, the social services system. So again, housing, food, employment, but also to say like, I've been there, I've been incarcerated, I've been successful coming home. Uh, 
And that experience then builds trust in the healthcare system, rebuilds uh, or builds, because it never was there, trust in the healthcare system so a person can return home. And so here's a picture of um, our late colleague and friend, community health worker, Jerry Smart, with uh, Dr. Lisa Puglisi, a colleague here um, in uh, uh, Yale, um, in our transitions clinic program, in the room with the patient helping navigate that care. Um, since that time in residency, we've studied the program and, of course, reduces acute care utilization, reduces actually any future criminal justice interaction. And the program has grown to the largest national network of programs in the country, almost 48 programs in 14 different states in Puerto Rico. And here, again, just to highlight this, um, we have a network of programs in Connecticut. In the Yale Cancer Center catchment area, we've provided primary care to a thousand patients that have left correctional facilities, again, each with a community health worker with histories of incarceration. And we currently have three statewide programs here in New Haven. This, this um, uh, network in Connecticut is led by Lisa Puglisi, who was in uh, the picture before in New Haven, Bridgeport, and Hartford. And we've been working closely with state policymakers and the Department of Corrections uh, and payers to really think about how we implement the model and how we uh, scale it so that there's more than just three programs. And so it's in the delivery of primary care, uh, again, having been here for 15 years, that we've seen a ton of folks that have come home um, either at, uh, with cancer or uh, really kind of uh, having uh, not accessed cancer prevention treatment and have turned, of course, to the literature to see, well, what's known about these higher rates of cancer? And so um, in so doing, um, what I'll indicate is that we've had the literature uh, prior to Carrie and I starting our investigation were single site studies that either studied incarceration uh, 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 outcomes, rather cancer outcomes when people were incarcerated or cancer outcomes when people were released. And so, um, but none that combined kind of the full story of how people move in and out of these two systems. So what we know is that individuals with a history of incarceration had higher rates of cancer risk factors, so smoking, alcohol use, HIV, and hepatitis C. Um, our team did a, a study, again, using what was available, national data um, showing that uh, the prevalence of lung cancer, cervical cancer, and alcohol-related cancers were higher among those that were justice involved compared to those that didn't have any exposure to the criminal legal system. And then one study, again, existed in Ontario, Canada, found that individuals with a history of incarceration have higher incidence of cervical, head and neck, liver, lung cancer compared with the general population. Of course, incarceration was also found to be associated with worse cancer survival. And there have been two studies that really highlight this. We uh, bring this up, uh, one that's it, showing that in prison, there's worse survival rates. So these data come from Texas, my home state. Um, and where you see the kind of solid dotted lines is the incarcerated individuals. Um, these data come from those that were in the Department of Corrections in Texas with cancer, and they compared it to data from SEER, and then they compared it to SEER data, individuals that are matched demographically. As you can see, there's decreased survival among those who have cancer. Uh, behind bars. And then similarly, following uh, release, uh, my friend and colleague Ingrid Binswanger published a study in the New England Journal. Again, these data come from Washington State and found that there's a significantly increased risk of dying um, in the first weeks to months post-release. You can see how high the bar is, one to two weeks following release do not have a pointer. Um, and again, cancer was one of the primary causes of death in that study. Um, so again, high rates of mortality, both incarceration, during incarceration and following release, but no studies really combine them. And no studies have really kind of gotten at mechanisms. So, you know, a lot of people, a lot of anecdotal evidence showing poor quality of care. When you turn to the literature, there hasn't been a lot of work looking at the quality of care of cancer outcomes. Uh, again, two studies, uh, multiple studies have done looking at the access to palliative care, only one study looking at cervical care, uh, cervical cancer care. And so again, this is a hypothesis, but not really borne out in the literature as of yet. 
And then some discussion about, of course, what are the social determinants of cancer outcomes? Um, and again, people don't have transportation, food, housing, a job. They often lack insurance, healthcare access. They have these competing priorities, again, with family, trying to meet the terms of parole, probation. And then there's a real stigma of having been incarcerated. And all these may play a role in how uh, they access cancer care coming home. And so this was a, a, a something that was important to both myself and uh, uh, Dr. Gross. And so we started thinking about, well, how can we um, together and with the amazing resources within the state, think about how it is that we can start informing what is driving uh, the higher rates of poor health outcomes among those that are just as important. Thank you, Emily, and thank you to the Cancer Center for <clears throat> inviting us to uh, to have a discussion with you today about um, this issue of, frankly, if we're thinking about health justice, unfortunately, as Emily points out, we need to be thinking about criminal justice. And if we're thinking about health equity, we need to be thinking about systemic racism and structural factors such as mass incarceration that are affecting all of our patients and all of our populations here in the state of Connecticut, as well as here at Smilo. Our collaboration with, uh, between the Copper Center and uh, Emily's wonderful group has really been personally an inspiration for me, seeing this, this mission-driven group of people who are not only doing research, but are also advocating for change. And I think this is a testament to the amazing environment here at Yale in that our offices were next door to each other for like 10 years and we kept thinking, oh, you're thinking of um, cancer outcomes and you know, you're thinking of uh, uh, improving um, health equity and health justice uh, for the current and formerly incarcerated patients and people. Why don't we uh, collaborate? Uh, it took us a while to figure it, figure it out, but uh, it worked well. And um, I, I think I, I would just use this as a brief pause to encourage all of you to uh, look outside of your primary domain, your primary area of focus, find people who share your values and your mission, uh, reach out to them because th th those are often the most fruitful, fruitful collaborations. Um, how do I do this? Huh. Okay, so Emily has done an excellent job of cultivating the intuition. There are three uh, dis distinct risk strata that we should think about as we shift over to talking about our particular uh, research endeavor. So there are people who are never incarcerated, people who are currently incarcerated, and then this third risk group are people who were recently released. Uh, that Binswanger article highlighted in the first one to two weeks after release, there's a, what is it, a fourfold increase uh, in, in risk of death. Also, as Emily pointed out, the whole point of the transitions clinic is during that very initial uh, transition that it's a very fraught time with increased risk. So anyway, that's why we have three groups here and we'll go through these in greater detail. Uh, for our study, um, based upon the prior literature, we looked at um, the relation between these three uh, risk strata and, uh, and the incidence or detection of, and, and prompt diagnosis of cancer. The second outcome of interest was cancer care. And third was um, cancer survival. Anybody want to hazard a guess for people who are incarcerated, what is the most common cause of death? We're in Cancer Center Grand Round. <laughs> cancer. I know you all like it's too easy. So that's uh, one of the motivating factors for, for, for our work is cancer is highly relevant to the incarcerated current and former population. Call out to our amazing study team. Um, um, we include people from uh, both the Site Center, uh, Copper, but also people uh, who work within the um, State Department of Corrections, uh, the, um, the state uh, Department of Public Health. Uh, it's really been a, a wonderful and diverse group. Again, uh, mission-driven being, the, I would say, the, the buzzwords, people that are really uh, wanting to not only do research, but use the evidence to drive change. And it's been an honor to be a part of this group. So first, let's talk about um, cancer incidence and diagnosis. Uh, our first 
study that I'll highlight was led by uh, Janirius Aminawang, um, looking at cancer incidence, addressing the questions, uh, what is the cancer incidence in the incarcerated and post-incarcerated population compared to the general population? And um, how does this differ across race and ethnic groups? So this slide is incredibly over simplistic. These arrows make these registers, these link linkages look very, very easy. Uh, this collaboration between the um, State Department of Health, Tumor Registry, the Department of Corrections uh, would not have been possible without um, years of prior uh, collaboration uh, with, with these different groups. And um, anyway, so the arrows are kind of like, oh, it's just easy. Uh, so um, the tumor registry data uh, was linked with the um, State uh, Department of Corrections data um, their master file as well as the movement file, which which uh, tracks when people are re released and and um, uh, readmitted if that happens. So looking at cancer incidents, um, there are some cha methodologic challenges. We don't have all the data that you traditionally would have when looking at the denominator. So for the incarcerated population, because people are going in and out, um, we just uh, looked at the uh, the mid 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 year inmate population. For the post-incarcerated population, for our denominator, uh, we discharge. Um, we basically looked, summed the number of people who are discharged every year, discounted by about a third because of recidivism. So it's just an estimate of how many people were uh, released and and in the community at any given time, <clears throat> and then the Connecticut general population. Cancer types. Uh, we looked at, <clears throat> excuse me, all invasive cancers as well as screen detectable, defined as such. <clears throat> so what we found, overall cancer incidence um, on the left side of this figure is the general Connecticut population. People who were um, um, incarcerated, you see there's a dramatically lower cancer incidence rate, but in that post-incarceration period uh, defined as one within one year after release, there's then a substantial bump up, substantial increase, which raises the concern that maybe there's underdiagnosis while incarcerated and then there's a catch up period afterward. We then looked at um, uh, strata by whether the cancers were screen detectable, such as uh, you know, colorectal, cervical, et cetera. Um, again, for the, uh, if you look at the gray bars, these are the screen detectable bars. So it's cancers. There's a dramatic, dramatic decrease in the incarcerated population. If you look at the relative change, and then there was a slight bump after release for the non-screen detectable cancers for which there are not routinely recommended screening tests. Uh, there's less of a substantial decrease when you go from general population to incarcerated, and then still there's a bump afterward. So this suggests that maybe the screen detectable cancers, uh, the reason why there's such a huge drop is that there's less screening in the incarcerated population. However, we don't have screening data. That's uh, a next um, uh, one of our next studies we're, we'll be addressing. Uh, Alana Richman here uh, in general medicine led the next study, uh, incarceration and cancer stage at diagnosis. So here, this is looking at um, the y-axis is the percent of people in each group whose cancer was diagnosed at an early, early stage. The incarcerated group, roughly 45%, recently released, a little more, 55%. And this is these are both lower than the general Connecticut populations. So we show, showed this to our collaborators in the Department of Corrections, and they said, well, hold on, it's not really fair because the full state of Connecticut has different demographics than people who uh, are at risk of incarceration. Maybe you could choose a different comparison group uh, to kind of level the playing field. So maybe just looking at people who have Medicaid um, statewide, uh, Connecticut, maybe they're a little more similar to the population that's incarcerated. And this is, again, for us, a, a, the, the beauty of having uh, these collaborations with stakeholders who can call us out on our initial plan that we we're going to publish. They're like, wait, hold on, guys. That's, that's not a good idea. Let's try something a little different. So um, we added a state of um, Connecticut Medicaid population. and. Still, we, we basically, the uh, percent early diagnosis, as you can see, was Medicaid is definitely lower than the full state of Connecticut, but still is a little bit higher than the incarcerated population. We then looked at uh, colorectal cancer. Now here, the story is a little bit different. 
the full state of Connecticut uh, did have more early stage of diagnosis, but all the other groups were roughly equal. So maybe the incarcerated people uh, in this case, were, were, they were pretty much equally likely of being diagnosed with, with the early stage of the full state of Connecticut. Prostate cancer, a slightly different story um, in that the state of uh, Connecticut Medicaid was substantially uh, better, more likely to be early diagnosed than the incarcerated and to a degree the recently released population. So uh, take home points here, which will be reiterated by looking at the adjusted standardized incidence rates um, are the, if you look at the left side, so this is the SIR. So the incarcerated group is the cent center column there. And basically 0 0.28, that means compared to people in the general population, people who are incarcerated have 28% um, uh, of the, the risk of, of being diagnosed at an early stage. And then recently released compared to the general population also is lower, but not as lower. So I'm not gonna go through these numbers in great detail because they show the same thing. Basically there is a decreased likelihood while you're incarcerated of being diagnosed at an early stage. And this seems like there may be a bounce back um, after, after you're released. And that also applies to late stage cancer. Moving on to mortality outcomes among people who were diagnosed with cancer. This is led by uh, Damalola uh, Oladaru. Here we uh, compared um, these three groups, people who were diagnosed with cancer while they were incarcerated as about 200 people, uh, people who were diagnosed after release, and then the large never incarcerated population. Um, uh, as you can see, uh, people who were um, diagnosed while incarcerated or post-release are substantially younger than the, um, the general population. Um, again, more likely to be uh, black or Hispanic. And the, the most common cancer types are slightly different between these groups, uh, largely reflecting probably differences in risk factors as well as age, age uh, distribution of the different populations with uh, GI, um, mainly colon and liver, um, lung, male reproductive and leukemia and lymphoma, particularly common in the incarcerated population. Uh, but to cut to the chase, what we found when you look at all cause mortality, um, these are uh, survival models that are based on our Cox proportional hazards model. Um, uh, the, the never incarcerated group um, has a much better survival outcome than either the incarcerated or post-release group. This means you were diagnosed after released or diagnosed incarcerated. Um, and the hazard ratio is basically two. So a twofold greater risk of death uh, if you're in either of these groups. We then added a uh, stage of diagnosis to the model to see, because uh, as you saw from the prior studies that there, there was a distribution, a difference in stage of diagnosis with incarceration. It didn't really change the hazard ratio, hardly at all. The, like the, the risk of death went from like 2.1 to 1.9 after you account for stage of diagnosis. So, so there are other factors that are causing this difference in risk of death. You want to look at cancer-related mortality. This was interesting, so I, want, I wanted to pause here because we were just talking earlier about transitions being a fraught time after after being released to the community. Here, you see again the never incarcerated folks have the best cancer mortality, but the incarcerated people are in the middle in the post-release actually have the worst cancer survival. Really making us worried about what's happening after release with regard to being people connect being connected to care. Uh, okay, so then our third outcome of interest is looking at the quality of cancer care, addressing uh, how does incarceration uh, affect quality. We have an ongoing study uh, that we're not going to be presenting today doing chart review, looking at specific quality measures and comparing incarcerated with um, non-incarcerated individuals. Is care different for individuals diagnosed during incarceration versus post-release? And we set out to identify perceptions regarding accessing um, high quality cancer care in the correctional system and in, in the immediate post-release period. Let me turn the microphone back over to Dr. Wong. All right, and so our last part of our study is really trying to center this work, um, again, in the voice and perspective 
of patients. And so we have a, a last aim focused on kind of what are patient perceptions regarding quality of cancer care in the correctional system and immediately post-release. This is being led by Alana Rosenberg in our team, as well as Dr. Dina Schulman-Green uh, at NYU now. Um, and uh, in this study, we're conducting in-depth interviews with purposeful sample of people just released uh, from prison or jail within two years uh, who have cancer. And so either they were diagnosed while they're incarcerated or diagnosed in the community. Um, and again, these are preliminary themes. We still haven't uh, quite finished up recruitment, um, but the themes are the of access. So access to care, timeliness, which I think is going to be of uh, critical importance, um, but also fragmentation of care. And not just again in the transition from the carceral system to the community, but even in um, communications that are bi-directional from the community back to the carceral system or transitions between different carceral facilities. Again, each individual facility has a different kind of structure. Um, and um, once you transition from one correctional facility to another, that often creates different barriers to care. Um, there were conversations uh, at a theme of communication, wanting more transparency in the uh, care plan, wanting availability of records. And so um, patients would often report that they had no idea what was going on, didn't have medical records, they have to pay for their medical records. And so this was a, a real issue of, of knowing, kind of centering the care plan around the patient. Um, of course, trust in healthcare writ large, but especially with, within the Department of Corrections was an issue. There were questions about the competence of care and the commitment to actually patient-centered care, again, both in the community as well as in the carceral system. Not surprisingly, there were, was a theme of kind of the correctional system and correctional officer role that, uh, as I had indicated before, that oftentimes correctional officers were the arbiter of care. They were kind of uh, in charge of triage, um, that they also could detect that uh, the criminal justice system was primary before healthcare. And so they would comment on shackling and also the presence of correctional officers in the healthcare space as they were getting their treatment. And then importantly, as we all know, as primary care providers, as cancer uh, providers, um, the themes of family, family supports came up, um, both as advocates from the outside, but also the importance of, of supporting a person through a, a you know, again, life-shaking experience like being diagnosed with cancer and getting treatment and, and um, clarifying the care plan. And so um, usually we like to have their voices. We couldn't get this prepared in time, but I'll just read these out loud. Um, that in terms of trust in the healthcare system, one person comments, medical care is so expensive now that when you're inside, when you're an inmate, you're really not looked upon. You're a liability now. They're not gonna really treat you. This guy's got 30 years, he's gonna die in prison anyway, or he's getting released. So we'll let them deal with it when he gets out. And so this is both a commitment, but also really signaling that, hey, because there's fragmentation in the healthcare system, the care isn't going to be delivered in the way that's central to the patient. The importance of family uh, was uh, uh, mentioned. And this participant notes, you gotta go a whole lot of things for them to get you an appointment. I got two sisters that are in my corner. I call them and tell them, and they would call the prison and keep complaining. And so who doesn't love a sister, but it's the sisters that are calling in to make certain that cancer care is, is being arranged. And what happens again, when you're aging behind bars, when you don't have sisters, you don't have family members that can advocate, that even know to advocate for your cancer care. And then importantly, access. Um, this patient, this participant is a New Haven resident just released with advanced cancer. And he says, a coworker just tried to hook me up with a medical cap, but they said something that I wasn't eligible. I forgot the exact reason. We had to jump through hoops to try to give me that one time that medical van. I had no way to get to my chemo. I was hoping that they could at least put me in Smilo here. That's right here. It had been a whole lot easier instead of going all the way out to New Haven. And I, I think it's important here just to frame that as Dr. Gross presented, we have work here in the community to be uh, kind of tackling, to improve the care uh, for this uh, vulnerable population. Of course, there's work in the carceral system, but thinking about what it is that we can do right here, right now, I think is a central focus of the work that lies ahead for us. And so in summary, we hope that you take away these key points. 
um, that incarceration has a substantial impact on overall health. Um, it's a profound mediator of health disparities. And, uh, you know, I think it's often overlooked. We don't measure it in our large population-based, uh, um, national population-based studies. We don't often understand that it, uh, it may be a key mediator in looking at black-white disparities and socioeconomic disparities. Um, and, and it needs uh, more attention. Incarceration is associated with increased risk of cancer incidence, later stage at diagnosis, higher cancer mortality rate. And this is both for those who are incarcerated and those who uh, are returning home to the community. And patient experience with cancer care while incarcerated and following release shows multiple domains in need of improvement. And so, you know, often when we give these talks, we're left with like, well, what can we do? You know, and so I just wanted to present some ideas that uh, Carrie and I had, and perhaps there are many others in the room. Um, but for those that of you that are involved in clinical care is to focus on centering care around the patient and not the inmate. So remove those shackles. We have the ability to also ask correction officers to leave the room. Uh, in certain ways, over the last 50 years, we've ceded power to a carceral system in our own healthcare system. And there are ways that we can do so. And again, if you're looking for guidance on the SAGE Center website, there are kind of guidance about what we can and can't do within a healthcare system. Secondly, consider compassionate release. There's policies, statutes in Connecticut now that enable you, especially as oncologists, to write for compassionate release. In 2019, prior to COVID, uh, when we um, did a FOIA of our records, only three people in the state of Connecticut were released under compassionate release. Um, how do you do this? The best way that we found, uh, and uh, we've been able to do this for per certain patients, is uh, to engage with the medical provider behind bars. Um, oftentimes they too are advocating and often feel like it's easier for a community provider to be in partnership. Um, these uh, requests have to go through the Connecticut Parole Board, um, but letters from outside physicians saying, we've got this person coming home. They're in our care, we'll do better. Um, it, the patient will do better if they come home um, is the kind of deciding factor in, in uh, moving forward with compassionate release. And then of course, if you practice within uh, Bridgeport, New Haven and Hartford, refer your patients that you're seeing that have just been released from uh, a carceral system to our transitions clinic programs. Again, on the SAGE Center website, you'll see the contacts for community health workers. Uh, again, y'all do everything for your patients. And we know oftentimes primary care can shift over to oncologists. But what's additional about transitions is having a community health worker that's had a history of incarceration, having real specific knowledge, research, uh, resources, and expertise to attend to, especially the social determinants of health for when people return home. Here, unique to our transitions clinic in New Haven, we have a partnership with the Yale Law School's medical legal partnership where we have Yale Law School students and a staff lawyer that are attending to the civil legal needs of individuals that come home. And so there's additional benefit to having primary care rooted within transitions clinic. If you're a researcher, I think you will know, especially those of you that run clinical trials, rarely do clinical trials include incarcerated people. And uh, I think that this is, as we all know, clinical trials are a real beacon of hope for uh, certain patients with certain cancers. Um, and it is possible to include them. It takes a lot of advocacy. We've been working at the SAGE Center nationally trying to think about how it is that we can have more individuals uh, that are incarcerated participate in clinical trials. But if uh, those of you that are running trials, please reach out to us. We would love to be in conversation. Advocate for the linkage of, of SEER data or cancer registries that are linked to correctional data. Um, again, you can see from the work that we've been able to do with the tumor registry in the Department of Corrections that this is how we can illuminate um, the actual disparities that exist within our state to then be able to identify uh, meaningful places of change. If you run the health system here at SMILO, um, creating partnerships with the Department of Corrections to improve prevention and treatment efforts, um, both in reach into the carceral system, but also thinking about how do the outreach efforts that the Yale Cancer Center is already making really target this population, those individuals that have just been released and their families. And lastly, concentrating our efforts on eliminating the social barriers to care. 
And so I'll end here, which is to say that these patients here and every day remind us that this work is urgent, that even as we forge forward with the science, that we need solutions now, that there are really things that each and every day that you can do in clinical care, in research, and in your work leading at the Cancer Center that will make a difference for these patients. So with that, we thank you for your attention and really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much for that fantastic talk. We have time for questions. The um, cost benefit of early screening and diagnosis is well known to us with a fairly substantial uh, literature, not for every cancer, but for most cancers. So you actually save money if you have a primary health care system that does a good job with screening and early diagnosis. Is this an argument that, ha that has been made in the carceral setting with the research that you're describing? Is there a signature uh, paper, a series of papers that we could cite as, as, we, as we argue these cases? Because, I mean, we know Byron Kennedy well, the medical director of the of the uh, Department of Correction. Uh, he used to be, of course, the uh, health director here in New Haven. Before that, health director in Rochester, an enlightened MD, PhD, a, a graduate of, uh, you know, an alumnus of Yale. So it's a window of opportunity, but he has to make the economic arguments. And if you can actually improve cancer care and save money, that argument might work better than the humanitarian argument. Well, I appreciate this question. And, you know, I think what's interesting is twofold. So in fact, of course, we're partnering with Dr. Kennedy right now and Dr. Richardson who run the, the uh, medical services behind bars. And let me just give you an example of kind of what they're up against. So I, I think that they plainly know, and I don't want to put words into their mouth, plainly know the cost savings and the like larger health benefits of early screening. Um, but to give an example, um, it's been nearly impossible prior to kind of fit tests, et cetera, to actually get colonoscopies arranged. And what it means is that, you know, there wasn't access within the healthcare system in the community where they could do it, or they feel like mammograms or getting a diagnostic biopsy were deprioritized. And so it really is more of an indictment, I think of kind of the, our statewide community healthcare systems and the ability for our carceral system providers to be able to access these screening. It's so much so that, um, of course, now that, for instance, colorectal screening has transitioned from colonoscopies, et cetera, that they now have instituted, um, again, trying to think about how you scale up fit testing, et cetera, within the carceral system, knowing the value of early screening and knowing that, again, rates of colon cancer are uh, climbing among Black men in particular, um, and that this is an important issue to really lean in on. I would just also add briefly that, <clears throat> first of all, for the patients with cancer who are in our study that who are incarcerated, the average length of stay was, I mean, time incarcerated uh, was four to five years. So there was plenty of time to potentially diagnose them early. The challenge is that these cancer screening tests, they're cost effective. They're usually not cost saving, right? So it's like $50,000 per quality. So it's an, it's an investment per quality, investment per survival. So part of it comes down to, it comes down to the cost argument, but also it comes down to the moral and ethical argument too. The, the other thing I just wanted to highlight now that you bring this up is these data that we present are from 2006 to 2016. And so again, there's an opportunity now to see how screenings change given uh, different modalities. So, but thank you for your question. Thanks so much for this talk. It um, has made me think so much. My name is Jen Capo. I serve as the chief of palliative care here at Smilo and across the hospital. And our team has been thinking about these issues over the last couple of years. We've just encountered a lot of moral distress about how several patients have been treated at the end of life. And um, we noticed the suffering that's not only physical with access to adequate symptom management, but also just the tremendous suffering that comes from all the psychosocial um, distress that accompanies not only a cancer diagnosis, but this history of an incarceration. And so um, 
you know, there is some data looking at the integration of palliative care into the care of patients um, who are um, incarcerated. Um, as a team in Connecticut, what would you want us to advocate for? How could we best affect the patients in our state? What would be the best next steps to care, to provide better care? You know, so I appreciate that. It's lovely to meet you in person in this way. And I think the first, uh, I would say first and foremost, and without a doubt, is get people home. So, you know, it, it blows my brains that like really, uh, and it's not that uh, only three people applied and got compassionate release. Many people have applied and only three got it. And so, you know, when you're seeing people in care within uh, the cancer center, when you're seeing a person that's shackled getting um, care to, uh, when you're seeing a person that has criminal justice involvement in clinic and you know that they're at, and again, of course, physicians were notoriously bad at predicting kind of when the end of your days are, but you know what I mean. Um, one, to start investigating how uh, compassionate release can be uh, used. And in, again, it's always with patient permission that either you're reaching out to also, and I'll just, not just those that are incarcerated, but for those that are on parole too. So, you know, just to give you an example, just because you're at the end of your days doesn't mean your parole and probation uh, terms end. And it is incredibly freeing at the end of your days to not have to report back to parole and probation. And these are ways that we can, again, get people out of the large reach of the criminal justice system. Um, Reporting means that every week you're going in, you're pissing, you know, in a cup to, to provide your urine. It's deeply dehumanizing. And for some of these individuals, it could have been 5, 10, 50 years where they've been doing so. We've had patients 50 years who've been under the carceral system. And so that's one. Secondly, I would say, you know, um, to me, some of the questions, I mean, I think uh, that you're raising, and again, I would have lots to say about this, but is the really important role of family. And uh, again, trying to think about how um, the policies, again, in the carceral system can include advanced directive planning that includes family. It's, you know, again, at the end of our days, the regrets that I've seen patients have are ones where they haven't been able to collect with family and family members. Also, again, we didn't touch on this in this talk, but 50% of Americans in the United States have an immediate family member that's had a history of incarceration, 50%. And so there's healing and important healing that comes from the family members being able to reintegrate with their loved ones that are behind bars, being able to have these conversations. And if you think about patients that are behind bars, for them to come up with their advanced, um, uh, uh, God, advanced care directed, thank you. I almost said a, uh, advanced directives without family members in the room, which currently they're often not. There was this paper that was recently published where if you don't have a family member, sometimes it's the carceral system that that is your you know proxy. These are the places I think that from a policy standpoint, uh, you know, clinically and then policy uh, uh, need advocacy. Thank you so much um, again to Drs. Wong and Gross for your talk today. We appreciate.